as we approach the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment coming up in February of 2020, it is really appropriate tonight that we actually examine how our democracy is working and how it is not. Uh, tonight, Paul Lowenstein is going to be speaking on fixing our broken democracy. Um, he is the founder of the We the People of Massachusetts of the Stoughton Sharon and a member of the Stoughton Sharon League of Women Voters. The We the People of Massachusetts is striving to add an amendment. Which amendment would this be, Paul? The 28th Amendment which would basically get big money out of politics and reverse the Citizens United decision. Um, I'll just give you what Marsha asked me to write tonight, say tonight, which is the anti-democratic Supreme Court decisions such as Citizens United versus FEC have opened the floodgates to corrupting influence of big money in our political system. Once a beacon of democracy for the rest of the world, our country has slipped to number five behind Chile and Estonia Excuse in the debate. Number 25. 25 or 20? 25. Is that what I said? I'm sorry. Sorry, 25. <laughs> in the Democracy Index published annually by The Economist magazine. As a consequence, 40,000 Americans are killed every year because we cannot pass common sense gun control. Millions of Americans cannot ask, access basic health care because we cannot update the Affordable Care Act or even implement what's already there. Our children face a climate catastrophe because we cannot pass the carbon tax, which actually is a really simple solution. It's really much more complicated than that. But only constitutional amendments can overturn flawed Supreme Court decisions, come and learn about and participate in a discussion this evening about the amendment we urgently need. Paul Lowenstein, I've known actually for about 20 years when we both were volunteering for NEPRA. Not only is he working hard to correct our democracy, but he has worked tirelessly for the town of Sharon and really helped them with their water quality standards and been a member of the Wisconsin River Watershed Association, an active member for years and years. So Paul Lowenstein, thank you for coming tonight. Here. Thank you, Pam. I want to start out before I launch into this, uh, just quickly um, recount a story to you that is near and dear to my heart. Um, in uh, around the year 19 uh, or 2000, a woman named um, Doris Haddock set out from Los Angeles to walk across the United States. And Doris, when she started, was 89 years old. And she did it. She walked 10 miles a day for a year and wound up in Washington, D.C. And the reason she did it was to pass the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002. And when it came up for a vote in the House, she spent a week walking circles around the Capitol building and talking to anybody who would listen to her and trying to promote this thing. Of course, she became quite famous in the process. Um, and then when the Senate took it up, she spent another week walking around the Capitol building, and it did pass both chambers and became the law of the land in 2002. Then, uh, fast forward to 2010, when the Supreme Court's Citizens United decision, which effectively nullified the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, and uh, Doris Haddock died a few months later. So it's such a heartbreaking story. I had to share it with you before I get started here. So I hope you'll pay close attention in, in honor of uh, Doris Haddock, whose nickname was Granny D. So welcome to Fixing Our Broken Democracy. This presentation is about the need for a constitutional amendment to overturn the Supreme Court decision known as Citizens United, which endowed corporations with constitutional rights as if they were real people and opened the floodgates to the corrupting influence of unlimited political spending. My name is Paul Lowenstein. I'm not a politician or a professional activist. I'm just a retired print shop owner and a concerned citizen. Like many Americans, I see a political system that caters to powerful special interests. That's why I volunteer my time to help build the broad movement we need if we want a democracy that serves the interests of all Americans. And afterwards, there's a sign-up sheet. Yeah, it's over there. So. Um, so what does democracy actually mean? The word democracy comes from the Greek demos, meaning people, and kratia, meaning power or rule. 
So it basically means the people rule. In its annual democracy index, The Economist, a well-respected weekly uh, magazine, downgraded the United States from a full democracy, countries shown in dark blue, to a flawed democracy, the countries shown in light blue. America should no longer be considered a beacon of democracy for the rest of the world. In a study of almost 1,800 policy initiatives, Political scientists from Princeton and Northwestern found that the preferences of average Americans have almost no effect on government policies. However, they found that the preferences of economic elites matter a lot. They concluded that America is more of an oligarchy, where a small, wealthy elite rules, than a democracy where the people rule. No wonder America has been downgraded to a flawed democracy. The Declaration of Independence, written by Thomas Jefferson, stated, all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. This ideal has inspired Americans for generations, but in the beginning, American society was far from equal. The first three words of the Constitution, we the people, are we the people. However, when it took effect in 1789, only white male landowners, about 5% of the population, could vote. Three years later, Kentucky dropped the landowning requirement, and one by one, other states followed. By 1856, adult, every adult white male could vote. Since then, we the people have repeatedly amended the Constitution to overturn anti-democratic Supreme Court decisions and expand the franchise to realize the dream of equality for all. In 1857, the Supreme Court's infamous Dred Scott decision upheld slavery, denying 4 million African Americans the rights of citizenship. That decision was followed three years later by the outbreak of the Civil War. Standing on the blood-soaked battlefield at Gettysburg, Lincoln uttered these immortal words, we here highly resolve that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. Following the Civil War, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments repudiated the Supreme Court's Dred Scott decision, freeing the slaves, asserting equal protection of the laws, and granting former male slaves the right to vote. The 14th Amendment, ratified in 1868, granted all persons equal protection of the laws. A woman named Virginia Minor thought that meant she too should be treated as an equal person, so she tried to register to vote. When she was turned away, she went to court. In 1875, the all-male Supreme Court uh, ruled against Minor, saying that the Constitution does not explicitly guarantee women the right to vote. Fortunately for me, the League of Women Voters does not hold a grudge and today allows men to join and vote as members. Lincoln's generation fought a bloody civil war to hold the nation together, hope, hoping the government of, by, and for the people would prevail. However, within a few decades, the robber barons of the Gilded Age, big industrialists such as Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, and J.P. Morgan, were making a mockery of that vision. The Gilded Age brought extremes of both great wealth and grinding poverty, as the robber barons made huge fortunes taking advantage of cheap labor at a time when workers had almost no rights. It was also a time of corruption in government. Lobbyists stalked the halls of Congress with money and gifts to bribe politicians into writing the legislation that corporations wanted. Sound familiar? Yeah. Corporate tycoons wanted to get their businesses out from under government control. Led by the booming railroad industry, step by step through the late 1800s, they manipulated and bribed state legislatures into lifting the restrictions written into corporate charters. They had their eyes on the biggest prize, the constitutional rights of natural persons. If corporations could invoke constitutional rights in court, they could avoid compliance with democratically enacted laws they didn't like, a practice known as the corporate veto. Corporate attorneys staked their claim on the 14th Amendment, which guaranteed all persons equal protection of the laws. Up until this time, it had been understood that a corporate was a separate kind of person, an artificial person. What does that mean? Well, let's say a group of people want to go into business together. They file with the state for a charter. 
once the charter is granted, the law treats the business as if it were one person so that it can do things like enter into contracts and file lawsuits. This gives the corporation a limited kind of legal personhood, and that's fine. Corporations need to be able to function that way. But that's really different from saying that they have all the rights of people under the Constitution. These are natural rights that are inherently part of who we are as human beings. There is nothing natural or inherent about a corporation. It's a legal arrangement created by an act of state law. We, the people, through our democratically elected representatives, grant corporations certain privileges, such as limited liability, so they can conduct their legitimate business affairs. But unlike constitutional rights, these privileges are neither inherent nor unalienable and are subject to modification through the democratic process. So the aim of the 14th Amendment was to ensure that flesh and blood persons who had been abused for so long as slaves had equal protection of the laws. But what actually happened? Between 1890 and 1910, the Supreme Court heard over 300 cases regarding the 14th Amendment. Most of them involved corporations, not former slaves. The Gilded Age did not last forever. Relying on constitutional rights such as freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and freedom of assembly, people fought back in great movements for change. These movements included the populists in the 1890s, led by William Jennings Bryan, who demanded the direct election of senators, citizen ballot initiatives, and other experiments in direct democracy. Then came the progressives, led by trust buster Teddy Roosevelt. He said, the great corporations, which we have grown to speak of rather loosely as trusts, are the creatures of the state. And the state not only has the right to control them, but it is duty bound to control them wherever the need of such control is shown. The Tillman Act of 1907 banned corporations from spending in elections. As Teddy Roosevelt said back then, Corporate expenditures for political purposes have supplied one of the principal sources of corruption in our political affairs. In 1920, the 19th Amendment finally gave women the right to vote, 45 years after the Supreme Court denied Virginia Minor her right to vote. This achievement was a giant leap forward for democracy. In 1937, yet another anti-democratic Supreme Court decision, Breedlove versus Suttles, upheld the constitutionality of poll taxes, effectively disenfranchising millions of citizens who could not afford to pay them. In 1964, the 24th Amendment banned poll taxes, overruling the Supreme Court and expanding the franchise. Depression era reforms such as Social Security, unemployment insurance, FDIC, and Glass-Steagall stabilized the economy and set the stage for a golden era in America after World War II. For decades, prosperity was widely shared as the middle class grew. In the 1950s through the 1970s, there were remarkable people's movements, such as the Civil Rights Movement and the Anti-War Movement. In 1970, the Supreme Court upheld state laws barring anyone under the age of 21 from voting, including young soldiers fighting in Vietnam. Just one year later, the 26th Amendment lowered the voting age to 18, once again overturning an anti-democratic Supreme Court ruling to expand the voting franchise and move toward the dream of equality. On the first Earth Day in 1970, 20 million Americans from coast to coast took to the streets to protest pollution, oil spills, and other harms caused by corporations. Earth Day won the support of Republicans, Democrats, and all kinds of Americans. It led to the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, the uh, passage of the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts, and many other laws to protect our shared environment. The Occupational Safety and Health Act was also signed into law in 1970 to provide safer workplace conditions. Lincoln's vision of government of, by, and for the people was becoming a reality. However, corporate America watched these developments with growing alarm and embarked on a counter strategy. This two minute clip from Heist, Who Stole the American Dream, shows what that corporate counter strategy was. Here, 
a decision was reached by corporate America that working with unions, uh, working with government to improve the standard of living for all people was not the right thing to do. Big business doesn't like the government to tell it what to do. They don't want anybody to interfere with their ability to make money in the way that they see fit. In 1971, corporate leaders began to orchestrate a detailed battle plan to eliminate any government policies that might stand between them and profits. The plan was laid out in an influential memo called Attack on American Free Enterprise System. Lewis Powell was a well-respected citizen of Richmond, Virginia. He was a corporate lawyer, a partner in a prestigious corporate law firm, and friends with uh, an executive at the Chamber of Commerce named Eugene Sidnor. And Sidnor asked his friend if he would draft a position statement that he could submit to the Chamber of Commerce that would then sort of form the framework for how to make the organization more able to confront what they thought was a, a growing threat to business interests. Powell's memo laid out a strategy to radically alter public perceptions, ensuring that big business interests would dominate public policy. Powell advocated a vast purge of liberal elements in society. He saw how corporate money could own the media and talk louder than organized labor and consumer protection groups. But for Powell, a future Supreme Court justice, the real end game was business control of law and politics. The Powell Memo and Chamber of Commerce strategy changed our society dramatically. Lewis Powell was a tobacco industry lawyer before Nixon appointed him to the Supreme Court. The robe he wore on the first day as a Supreme Court justice was a gift from the Philip Morris Company. While he was on the Supreme Court, Powell helped decide a number of cases that extended the constitutional rights of real people to artificial incorporated entities. In Buckley versus Vallejo, the court ruled that government can't limit the amount of money that candidates spend on elections. This is a decision that created the notion that money equals speech. In First National Bank versus Bellotti, the court ruled that limiting corporate expenditures to influence ballot initiatives constitutes a violation of the First Amendment speech rights of corporations. Decisions like these led to more money in elections and more corporate influence. When corporations are given constitutional rights as if they were real people, they can use them in court to avoid compliance with laws they don't like. In his book, Constitutions Are Not People, author Jeff Clements describes how corporations use constitutional rights to circumvent democratically enacted laws protecting our health, safety, and environment and they have done so hundreds of times. One such corporate veto happened right here in Massachusetts. Recognize Joe Camel, the mascot created to market cigarettes to kids. In 1998, Massachusetts passed a law to protect children by banning cigarette advertising within 1,000 feet of schools and playgrounds. The Supreme Court struck down the law, saying it violated the First Amendment speech rights of tobacco companies. This case raises the question, should corporations have a constitutional right to advertise their products regardless of the consequences for society? Or should we the people be free to set limits on commercial speech when it threatens our health and well-being and that of our children? With its Citizens United decision of 2010, the Supreme Court struck down the democratically enacted Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, Doris Haddock, and opened the floodgates to big money in politics and corporate domination of our government. Four justices dissented. Justice John Paul C. Stevens said, corporations help structure and facilitate the activities of human beings to be sure, and their personhood often serves as a useful legal fiction, but they are not themselves members of we the people, by whom and for whom our constitution was established. In the wake of the Citizens United decision, things have only gotten worse. The corruption of corporate political influence is now spreading to the states. In 1912, Montana passed the Corrupt Practices Act, 
that was 100 years ago, okay, which banned corporate money in its state elections to end the widespread corruption of the Copper Kings when powerful mining interests in Montana routinely bought judges, controlled newspapers, and bribed lawmakers. In 2012, just two years after Citizens United, the Supreme Court nullified this 100-year-old Montana law on the grounds that it violated the First Amendment speech rights of corporations. In 2014, the Supreme Court issued another anti-democratic decision in the case of McCutcheon versus FEC that struck down the FEC's limit on how much an individual may contribute during an election cycle. McCutcheon's attorneys argued that campaign contributions are a form of free speech. As a result, billionaires such as Sean McCutcheon may now contribute millions, drowning out the voices of average Americans. Outside spending on elections has skyrocketed since the Citizens United decision. Corporate executives focus on profit. They buy political influence because it offers a high return on investment. The late Senator John McCain said, Money does buy influence in Washington, and access increases influence that often results in benefiting the few at the expense of the many. He co-authored the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act to limit money in politics. The Supreme Court Citizens United decision effectively nullified that law, once again undermining the fundamental principles of equality and democracy at the heart of our great experiment in self-government. As a result of anti-democratic Supreme Court rulings in modern times, only those with vast financial resources have a voice in our political system, and corporate constitutional rights trump the interests of the citizens whom the Constitution was designed to protect. Today, our country is arguably no more democratic than it was in the beginning, when only white male landowners had the right to vote. Checkbook democracy has consequences. We've already talked about how corporate constitutional rights prevent us from protecting our children from cigarette addiction. Let's look at a few more examples of the consequences of allowing powerful special interests to dominate our political system. Americans pay far more for health care than other developed countries. But our life expectancy ranks 26 out of 35 developed countries. Political contributions by the health industry have been rising. Could that be why Congress won't even consider a single-payer option like most other developed countries? The fossil fuel industry spends tens of millions of dollars uh, every uh, election cycle on political donations. The amounts have increased dramatically since Citizens United. In return, Congress provides billions in subsidies and tax breaks every year to the fossil fuel industry despite the existential threat of climate change. Political leaders know they'd better play the money game if they want to get reelected. Members of Congress can easily spend half of their work days raising money, forcing them to lean to the green, meaning money, not the environment. We have a systemic problem, and we need a systemic solution. Let's take a look at the framework the Constitution provides and where people and corporations fit into it. It starts by establishing that we, the people, are sovereign. We have inalienable rights, which are designed to protect individual citizens from abuse by the government and other powerful entities. Then, from the people, from the consent of the government, comes the power of government. Government doesn't have rights. It has only the powers and duties that the elected representatives of the people decide it should have. That's the backbone of the system that the con Constitution laid out. Then, on down the line, at the state level, government uses the power delegated to it by the people to create something called a corporation. This is an artificial entity. It is legally separate from the people who own it or work for it. It has specific privileges, which are granted to it through the state charter that creates it and its operations are subject to a democratically established body of business law. So the Constitution puts we the people in charge of our government, which is supposed to serve and protect the interests of all the people. But what does this framework look like when corporations are given the same constitutional rights as real people? 
Now corporations can use their vast financial resources to influence the government to serve their own narrow interests, which are usually quite different from the interests of the general public. And they can invoke the inalienable constitutional rights of real people in court to avoid compliance with laws they don't like. Let's take a look at what we can do to fix our broken democracy. Many people thought Hillary Clinton would win the 2016 election and appoint new Supreme Court justices who would overturn Citizens United. However, the election results prove that a constitutional amendment is the only lasting way to overturn the Supreme Court rulings at the root of the problem. To revitalize our great experiment in self-government and live up to Lincoln's vision of government of, by, and for the people, we must amend the Constitution to affirm that corporations are not real people and money is not free speech. Many generations of Americans have amended the Constitution. Now it's our turn. Amending the Constitution to establish political equality and affirm the constitutional authority of we the people over powerful special interests is the great challenge of our generation. We must win an amendment that achieves two core goals. First, the rights protected by the Constitution are the rights of natural persons only, i.e. artificial entities such as corporations do not have constitutional rights. This is referred to by the slogan, corporations are not people. Second, the spending of money to influence elections is not protected free speech under the First Amendment, and Congress and the states must regulate it to ensure political equality for all. This is referred to by the slogan, money is not speech. Once we win such an amendment, we can elect representatives who are accountable to the people rather than corporations, and who can spend their time governing rather than fundraising. The Supreme Court will not be able to nullify democratically enacted campaign finance reforms. With democracy working better, we can take on solving the many crises facing our country. There are two ways to propose an amendment to the Constitution, a two-thirds vote by Congress or a convention called by two-thirds of the states. Neither Congress nor a convention can change the Constitution in any way. All either can do is propose an amendment. The proposed amendment must then be ratified by at least three quarters of the states before becoming part of the Constitution. This is a very high bar, as we saw with the Equal Rights Amendment in the 1980s. Massachusetts is one of 20 states and over 700 cities and towns, including Boston, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Philadelphia that have formally called on Congress to propose a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. However, despite huge bipartisan demand for dem democratic reform, Congress has still not proposed the amendment we need, and they do not appear likely to do so anytime soon. With Congress seemingly paralyzed, it's time for the states to call for an amendment proposing convention. So far, five states, Vermont, California, Illinois, New Jersey, and Rhode Island have done so. Massachusetts, the cradle of American democracy, should join them. If 34 states call for an amendment proposing convention, Article 5 of our Constitution requires Congress to organize a convention of delegates from the states. Congress has never ceded its amendment proposing authority to a convention, and probably never will. However, that does not mean the process of lining up states to call for a convention is not useful. Four of the last amend 11 amendments were proposed by Congress only after states began calling for a convention. Regardless of whether an amendment is proposed by Congress or a convention, it cannot become part of the Constitution until it is ratified by 38 states. Only an amendment proposal with broad bipartisan support would stand a chance of clearing that high bar. Because both major parties control more than 13 states, and thus each party effectively has veto power over any partisan amendment proposal. We the people, Massachusetts is promoting a democracy amendment in three ways. First, we are working to pass the We the People Act, which calls for an amendment proposing convention limit, limited to the topic of over, overturning Citizens United. So far, 91 of the 200 state legislators have co-sponsored this bill but we need even more support to bring it to a vote this session. Second, we're weighing in with a Citizens Commission created last November by ballot question number two 
to make recommendations on the language of the 28th Amendment and a strategy to achieve it. The Commission's recommendations are due by the end of this year. They are sure to be influential, so it's important to attend their hearings, write letters, and find ways to make sure their recommendations reflect our need to fix our broken democracy. Third, we are also working to pass the We the People Amendment in Congress. This amendment proposal would affirm that constitutional rights are for real people, not artificial entities such as corporations, and that money is not a form of speech protected by the First Amendment and shall be regulated by Congress in a way that does not allow greater political influence for the wealthy. We are very concerned that Congress will propose a weak amendment such as House Joint Resolution 2, which could accommodate business as usual. If passed, this amendment proposal would free up an effective amendment such as H.J. Res. 48, which would require democratic reform. Here are some things you can do. Thank Representative Paul McMurtry and Senator Michael Rush for co-sponsoring the We the People Act. Send them each a letter to that effect from the Westwood League of Women Voters. Urge the Citizens Commission to recommend an effective amendment such as H.J. Res. 48 and to recommend that Massachusetts call for an amendment proposing convention. And uh, third, um, call Senators Warren and Markey and ask them to file House Joint Resolution 48 in the U.S. Senate. Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government, except all the others. If we want to continue to govern ourselves, it's up to us, we the people, to fix our broken democracy. Let's show our children, through our actions, that democracy should not be for sale. For more information on the amendment and the convention, as well as a list of relevant online videos, please visit uh, this uh, web link. Uh, I, I don't think you want me to. If you want it, it's on the card on the table there, so you can grab it from that or write it down. Thank you for listening. That uh, finishes my presentation, so uh, I'm happy to take questions. Yes, they did. To Bill, that so, and it's it's in committee now, I assume. Uh, what, it's what in the uh, joint committee on veterans and federal affairs. It being a federal affair, so uh, if they had a hearing already. We had I don't know sixty or so people testify over a couple hours, and uh, this is the third time we've. Uh, Rousted out the troops to truck into Boston and testify in support of our bill. Um, hopefully, they'll give it a, a favorable report. The two committee chairs are both co sponsors, so we're hopeful that the committee will give it a favorable report. But that only means that it's eligible for a vote uh, in, on the House and Senate floor. It doesn't mean that it will come to a vote. It's really up to the Speaker of the House and the Senate President to decide. Uh, what bills get voted and what bills don't. Uh, there is significant controversy over our bills related to the fact that it calls for an amendment proposing convention, <clears throat> which is often erroneously referred to as a constitutional convention. We had one of those in 1787 before we had the Constitution and before we had Article 5, which spells out the rules for proposing amendments. Um, this is not a constitutional convention. That, uh, the original convention threw out the Articles of Confederation and replaced it entirely with a whole new constitution. That is unimaginable in this day and age. However, the founders anticipated and intended that the constitution be a dynamic document and that it be amended from time to time to suit the evolving needs of the country. And in fact, it has been 20, uh, amended 27 times. And it's hard to imagine what our country would look like if we hadn't amended the Constitution. It still has slavery, we couldn't vote, we'd have that poll to access. I mean, it would really be uh, practically unrecognizable. So amendments are very important. And with 27 amendments over the history of our country, we've averaged approximately one per generation. The last week, well, the last one we had that we ratified was the 27th Amendment in 2002. The 27th Amendment was first proposed 202 years 
previously. Yes. And little by little, and it was no time expiration on that particular one. Um, before that, it was the uh, 26th Amendment, which was 1971, to give young soldiers and any young person at least 18 years of age the right to vote, mainly precipitated by the Vietnam War and the, the immorality of asking young people to go over and risk their lives and not be able to vote. Are you kidding me? So, but that was 1970, so 29 plus about 48 years, right? Because we've been more than a generation since we've had an amendment that wasn't proposed 200 years ago. So it's time. Um, and it's not just a matter of it being time, but it's a matter of it being a necessity if we really care, if, if we really care about living in a democracy or passing a, dem a democratic form of government down to our children and grandchildren. It's up to us. Are we gonna tolerate this or why not? Have any other states uh, shown interest to follow suit and have a similar people? Yes, there are quite a few states with similar bills in the pipeline. As I said before, five states, um, Vermont, California, Illinois, New Jersey, and Rhode Island, have already passed bills calling on Congress formally applying for an amendment proposal we need, uh, what, 29 more. We got a long way to go. We'll probably never get there, but that's okay. Our job is to, as citizens of Massachusetts, is to stand up and not leave those other five states twisting in the wind, but join them and, and get keep the ball rolling and set an example for other states and build momentum towards this so that Congress will see the writing on the wall and propose the amendment that we urgently need. Does that answer your question? Yes. Um, could you, um, I, I think the um, one concern about if the states succeed in having an amendment proposing convention happen, um, isn't one of the concerns that um, those at the convention can bring in other possible amendments other than the Absolutely, that is a concern. And for that reason, I, on the back side of one of those two uh, handouts, there's the exact uh, type or the, the, the bill is actually written in its entirety. It's on, and if you look, if those of you have it, if those of you don't come, come up forward and grab them so you can follow along. I think it's yeah, you well, take one of each, and on the back side of one of them is the bill. I think this is an extremely important point because fear of an amendment proposing convention has stymied our bill here in Massachusetts and in other states where it's come close. But we've actually brought this to the floor of the Massachusetts Senate. Um, and they actually passed the bill, but not before amending it to strip out the convention call, which is the thing that we pointed out as a matter of concern. Um, I think the fact that the right wing has been so successful in modern times has spooked a lot of uh, liberals, should we say, and made them very fearful that they'll use bully boy tactics to commandeer the convention and propose some right wing amendment. And I'll address that by saying that, um, first of all, our bill, if you look at the bill down near the bottom, you'll see some underlying text there, which basically says that Massachusetts cannot be counted as one of the 34 states calling for an amendment proposed to convention on the topic of overturning Citizens United unless Congress limits the topic of the convention to overturning Citizens United. So if Congress either uh, convenes an open convention without limiting it, or calls it on any other topic, Massachusetts cannot be counted. We borrowed the language from Vermont's bill, which did pass. And so both Vermont and Massachusetts would drop out. So you get to 34 states, Congress 
doesn't limit the convention to the topic of Citizens United. Two states drop out. Now you only have 32 states. Actually, in the, in the process of getting from the five states we have now all the way to 34 states, it's almost certain that other states will borrow this language. But even in the unlikely event that they didn't, at least two states would drop out. Now you don't have 34 states anymore. Now Congress doesn't have the authority to convene the convention. No convention. So that limits the topic to this topic of Citizens United. Now let's just say that didn't work. There's whatever reason. Um, and they go went ahead and proposed a partisan amendment proposal, such as a balanced budget, or abortion rights, or term limits, or some other topic. Do you really think that states are going to ratify an amendment proposal on a topic that they didn't send their, their delegates to propose. It's highly unlikely that you're going to get a lot of cooperation there because the states like Massachusetts say, we sent you there to do Citizens of the United, you're coming back with a balanced budget. We're not doing that. And they wouldn't ratify it. And really, because both major parties control more than 13 states, which is all it takes to kill an amendment proposal, as we found out in the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, there's no way a partisan amendment going to pass. The only kind of amendment that has a chance of being ratified is a bipartisan amendment proposal with broad support. So, and what's so scary about that? I mean, if everybody wants an amendment, that's democracy, okay? Taking the amendment proposing convention off the table is equivalent to taking democracy itself off the table. And we're stuck with a Congress who isn't going to act, hasn't acted for 10 years. Even though 80% of Americans uh, have voted in what or have indicated in polls or voted in ballot questions to support the idea of an amendment proposing convention. Here in Massachusetts, um, in the wake of Citizens United, 2012 and 2014, a bunch of us organized um, an effort to put this question on the ballot district by district. We did it in 208 cities and towns in Massachusetts. Wherever we could find a volunteer who was willing and able to go out and collect 200 certified signatures, they put it on the ballot in their district. And we reached 1.1 uh, million voters, of which 77.7% voted yes, we want an amendment uh, to overturn Citizens United. So that's pretty strong evidence. And the worst we ever did, we never lost in any town. The worst we ever did was 66.7%, exactly two thirds. That two to one. That was the worst we did. So the people in Massachusetts wanted national polls give you the same kinds of, of I think a Bloomberg poll in 2015 found that 78% of Americans wanted this. And, and it's pretty even. I mean, the Democrats usually are a little bit more in favor, but the Republicans aren't far behind. The rank and file Republicans, I'm not talking about you know, the Republican leadership, but the ordinary Republicans uh, understand the Constitution, understand democracy, understand the meaning of the words, we the people, and they're for it. We'll argue to tell doomsday about the issues. That's what Winston Churchill's quote is about, democracy being messy and the worst, a bad form of government. It's the worst form of government except for all the others. It is messy. We argue about stuff all the time. That's the nature of democracy. But that doesn't mean that, you know, it's a if we don't, if we don't defend democracy, we're going to get something worse. And we really, you know, I think because of the money in politics, um, I think a lot of people have become very cynical and frustrated about government, knowing that our Congress people are more responsive to wealthy, powerful people and large corporations than they are ordinary Americans. And, I think they got fed up in 2016 and just voted for someone who promised to drain the swamp. Uh, and look what, we, what came of that. I mean, we're slipping towards a more autocratic kind of government where the president is, you know, defying the laws and taking matters into his own hands. And, and it's not pretty at all. It's not good. It's dangerous, actually. And if we don't, you know, start making our democracy work in a way that inspires confidence in the people, that the government's actually working for the people and not for powerful special interests, 
Watch out. Any other questions? Sorry, we can be so long <laughs> Yes. Is there opposition to it in the state legislature? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, it's coming primarily from a surprising source, and that is common cause. Uh, they are definitely afraid of an amendment proposing convention for the reasons that we talked about. Um, and as a matter of fact, the League of Women Voters has joined common cause in signing a letter to the state senators, which pretty much uh, resulted in the passage of the amendment that stripped the convention call out of our bill. And then they passed the bill 37 to 1. But the vote on the amendment, which was the key vote, was 23 to 15. We thought we had 25 uh, votes. And 10 of them flipped at the last minute in response to a letter sent by Common Cause and signed by a lot of other groups, uh, fear monitoring about the um, Amendment proposed a convention, which they referred to as a constitutional convention, as part of their fear mongering shtick. If you want to know the both the arguments from both points of view, what we did was we took that letter the Common Cause sent to the state senators to dissuade them from passing our uh, convention call, and we broke it down sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, and we addressed all the concerns. Uh, and statements that they made, some of which were quite inaccurate. Uh, that document, the back and forth, is in a file. It's actually document number 11 in a folder called the convention. And if you see, look at your uh, handout there, you'll see a, a QR code with a, um, a web link there called HTTP. It's this one right here. It's HTTP double slash bit dot go slash citizens commission. There are two folders in there. One's called the amendment, one's called the convention. And in the convention folder, document number 11, is our point by point uh, response to the letters sent by Common Cause. And I encourage you, if, you're, if you have second thoughts about the wisdom of calling for an amendment proposing convention, read that document and don't forget that. Taking the convention off the table is likely to result in no, no amendment because Congress has shown itself to be indisposed to proposing the amendment we need. So if we don't pressure them by calling for a convention, they're probably not going to do anything, which means we might as well settle for the all that we live in now. And with all the problems that comes with it, 40,000 gun fatalities a year in our country, way more than other countries. Why? Because we can't pass common sense gun regulations, not to defy the Second Amendment, but just to regulate guns. If they do it in other countries, and they greatly reduce the, the carnage. We can do so too, but for the money that comes from the gun manufacturers, funneled through the NRA. Uh, look at climate change, as I said in my presentation. They put up about $50 million every two years cycle, and they get about $20 billion in return. That's a, something like a 400 to 1 return on investment. What sane business person would jump at the opportunity to get $400 back for every dollar they invest? I mean, it's crazy. Uh, and yet, it's very effective. They, they do fine. We don't. <laughs> yes. Claire. So if 40, 34 states tell, pass, pass, pass like applications for a convention to, yeah. to request a convention that's a single topic, or even if a few of them insist that it's a single topic, does Congress have to do it? Is this a yes. formal thing? No, no, it's not optional. The, con the Constitution says shall. The Constitution okay. shall convene a convention on the application of 34 states. And it's, it's called in the Constitution. In Article 5, it's referred to as a convention for proposing amendments. It's not referred to as a constitutional convention. Those guys knew what a constitutional convention was. They, they sweltered through the summer heat in Philadelphia to hammer one out. And they understood that you don't want to do that again. That you know, let's work with the Constitution. We have something doesn't work quite right. They understood that it needed that they couldn't be perfect, but they made it pretty good. 
And they gave us an opportunity to evolve that, which we have done through the amendment proposal convention process. But as I said earlier, it's really the essence of democracy, this process that they've built into Article 5. And shame on us if we don't use it if we're too timid to you know, take whatever tiny risk there might be uh, with calling for an amendment proposal convention. I'm frankly at a loss. Well, I guess you could say, well, what if they propose a bad amendment? Well, in that case, we won't ratify it. I mean, where's the danger here? I just don't see it. But they are fanatically opposed to it. They send out emails asking for money, saying, we are doing the hard work of protecting you from this terrible amendment proposal. They don't call it. They call it a constitutional convention, as if it were going to throw out the whole Constitution, which it just it not only can't throw out the Constitution, it can't even change the Constitution. They can't. All they can do is propose amendments. That's all they can do. That's all that Congress can do. It's up to the states through the ratification process to amend the Constitution. It's the only way. Uh, yes? Could this um, go the route of, is, of the Electoral College having not an amendment to get rid of the Electoral College? But each state, they could um, vote, and it would be the popular vote. Have you, you know what I'm trying to say? Obviously, I'm not saying it well. So that way, there isn't. Are you asking how to apply for whether a convention or a state legislature? Well, well, no. I'm saying that if um, the uh, Citizen United to get rid of, let's say, in each state, mm -hmm. do it the way that there's some proposals now for getting rid of the Electoral College, not by having it. Yeah, yeah. Process. The Electoral College, that's a separate issue. It's another way to improve our democracy is to get rid of the Electoral College, get it out from between the people directly voting for the candidate. And as a matter of fact, I found out about the National Popular Vote Compact, Interstate Compact, at about two years ago when I made this presentation to the Westwood League of Women Voters. And uh, I think it was uh, Marsha Hirschberg who yes. explained it. She took me aside afterwards. You gotta, you gotta get on board with this. It's great stuff. What, what they're proposing to do is to have states uh, vote to promise to allocate all their electoral votes to whoever wins the national popular vote. And if enough states agree to do that, enough states that control 200, uh, at least 270 electoral votes, then whoever wins the national popular vote will get those 270 um, electoral votes, regardless of who wins in those states. Right. And the winner of the national popular vote will win the election. And I think they're up to something like 189 uh, uh, electoral votes are in the compact now. We need another close to 100 more, not 89 more. You can read all about it. There's a map that shows the states that have joined. It's in uh, Wikipedia. And it's one of several ways we can improve our democracy. It's important to get the money out of politics. It's important to overturn the electoral college. It's important, I think, Ranked choice voting, I think, would do wonders for our democracy. As we saw in Maine, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the idea, but what is it called? it's called ranked choice voting. Basically, choice. there are multiple candidates, and you go in and rank them first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Oh. So let's say there's five candidates. And let's say nobody gets 50% on the first ballot. And so what would happen is the candidate who got the fewest first place votes would be eliminated. And their second choice votes would then go to the candidates whom the voter said, this is my second choice. Uh, and, and then if there still wasn't anyone who got the 50%, you'd do it again. And you drop one person out, reallocate their votes, and keep doing that until somebody gets 50.1% or something like that. And, and that way, whoever wins is going to have at least 50% support. Uh, in Maine, they had this Governor LePage for two terms. He's a Republican. And there were, he ran against two Democrats twice. And both times, the Democrats split the vote. 
the page won the governorship without getting 50% of the vote. So for eight years, Maine uh, limped along under a governor who did not have majority support, which caused a lot of aggravation out there. And so the people of Maine decided we would rather have ranked choice voting, and they passed a citizen ballot question. And then it passed. And then the legislator, legislature said, no, it's unconstitutional. And they made them do another um, uh, citizen ballot question, a second time, fixing whatever technicality. And it passed again. So they went ahead and now they have ranked choice voting up there. And then there is a bill in Massachusetts. In fact, you can look for it on your ballot a uh, year from now, in November of 2020. They'll probably be question about shall Massachusetts do ranked choice voting I think and uh, so I encourage you to vote for it. Yes? Do you know uh, if, they, if they're anywhere close to getting, they have to get like 60,000 signatures to get that put on the ballot. Do you know where that's I heard a rumor that they had enough that they were trying to get more to, to uh, make a statement. I didn't bring the sign up thing. I think the deadline has passed for submitting yeah. only two and a half months to do this and start in September so yeah, sometime this month it was Yeah, it was so I, I think the deadline is just about now, and I think they have enough. I'm assuming they have enough. I'm hoping they have enough. Um, so that's what it is, yeah. And there are other things we need to do, too, like uh, gerrymandering. You know, it's hard to get the will of the people expressed when you have gerrymandered districts. In gerrymandering, what happens is the politicians pick the voters instead of the voters picking the politicians because they gerrymander around to make sure that the Republicans are all the Republican districts and the Democrats are all the Democrat districts and it's, it's no contest. So um, that's another uh, problem we have with our democracy. So we have all these issues, but and they're all important. And the more of them we can pass, the more, the, the less we'll drift into all of them. Uh, and the more we can deal with some of the major crises facing our country. I've rattled on for a long time. I'm sorry to be so long with it. It's an important issue. And, yes. um, I hope that you'll take it to heart and do what you can. Educate yourself about the issue. You know, read this literature. Go to that uh, web link that I gave you and take a look at it. There, oh, one other thing you'll find at that website. There's a folder on the amendment, the folder on the convention. So depending on which side you're interested in, it's already organized. At the front of each folder, when you go into the folder, the first document is a table of contents, listing all the do documents in there, so you can scan down the side that you want to read. Or outside of those two folders, there is a one-page list of 51 uh, online videos. There's the name of the video, who did it, how many minutes it is, and a link. And it's clickable. So you open up that PDF and you just click the one you want to listen to or watch and have at it. They range in duration from two minutes to two hours. And there's full documentaries and there's some pretty well known people here and there who think Doris Kearns Goodwin is in one of them, for example. So in, in wrapping up here, I just want to, if you're willing to spend two minutes to listen to a song about this, it's, it's a hilarious song. Um, just, uh, it's, uh, it's about, it's about Citizens United, actually. Let's see if I can. Whoops. Oh, here it is. So it's number 51 on the list of those online videos, so uh, I can't, oh, here it is, I got it. Listen to the words. There we go. Real people have hearts. Real people have brains. Real people like you and me have blood running in our veins. Real people can laugh. Real people can cry, and real people are in trouble, i tell you why. Our Supreme Court, 
They're not very smart. They're having trouble telling us apart from corporations. As insane as that may seem, the Citizens United is a, a corporation's dream. Money's now in charge of our government, destroying our democracy and our environment. They need our help to straighten out what people here are really all about. Real people have brains. Real people have hearts. Real people can't outsource their body parts. We don't have boards of directors. We don't have CEOs. You can't buy shares in people, at least not the ones I know. All the justices seem quite confused despite their legal skills. They're mixing up our right to speak with dollar bills. Real people don't have fleets of private jets. And the government don't bail out our private debts. And if we call our congressmen, they don't pick up the phone. We don't have any justices or lobbyists to call our own. We can't afford those ads. Well, you can yeah, you can I'll leave. There's a couple more minutes, and it's all there. So I encourage you uh, to go to that website, find the um, the page that has the list of videos, and go right to the bottom. It's number fifty-one. It's the last one. Oh, and by the way, I think it's number forty-seven. Uh, it's near the bottom. There's a play done by a woman named Barbara Bates Smith from um, Asheville, North Carolina. She's a wonderful actress, an elderly lady. She does a soliloquy and tells the story of Granny B. Um, it's called Go Granny B, and it's it's really worth watching. It's about 47 minutes. I've already seen it twice live, once in Washington, once in Massachusetts. And um, I've seen it, I've watched the video as well. So it's well worth it. Uh, she was a character. She was from New Hampshire, and she cared about democracy. After she got done with all this walking, by the way, she and some friends of hers went out and bought a beat up van and drove 23,000 miles around the country registering people to vote. And if that weren't enough, I think it was Judd Craig was running, was the incumbent in New Hampshire. If I'm not mistaken, and the Democratic challenger dropped out with a short time before the election. So the Democrats recruited Granny B to run against <laughs> this guy, and she got 40% of the vote. <laughs> it's a great story. There's a book about her. You can see uh, what it looks like on the table there. Uh, I encourage you to buy it and read it if you're interested in Granny B. She's quite a character and has quite a life story. And really, truly, cared about democracy, a real salt of the earth Yankee who was willing to put her body, you know, on the line for democracy and uh, sat in the Supreme Court, uh, ignored her. But um, that's why we have to step up and fight for our democracy. Yes? Um, with everything that is going so wrong, would you say, would you rate this as like a circle, you want to get involved. Yeah. Would this be the biggest bang for your buck to fight for this? I I can't stand here and say that. I think what's important is that you get involved in civic affairs wherever you think it's important. I started out, I sold my business in 2002. I got involved in the Water Committee. I spent 10 years on the Water Committee and chair of promoting water conservation. We actually reduced our water use and sharing from 600 million gallons a year to 400 million gallons a year. Um, and then uh, I felt like, you ever hear that, that story about this seven in one blow, I think it was, where the guy, the Taylor killed seven flies with a fly squatter in one blow, he thought he was pretty hot stuff, so he went to the king and offered to kill the big dragon or whatever. So anyway, but sometimes it feels like that. Um, 
then uh, I got involved a little bit in climate related stuff and solar, but um, eventually, you know, I realized that we, uh, and all I got involved in that bottle hole thing, where we wanted to expand the bottle hole, we're tired of seeing plastic bottles all over the landscape, so. Just in case some, politics right there. Right? Yeah, yeah, classic yeah. example. That's what really Respect. knocked it into my head. We, I collected 600 signatures by myself for that. And we got 150,000 signatures across the state. Um, Lynn Walbarts, she used to be with the Sharon Stone League of Women Voters, a real biomedicine. She and I worked on that really hard. And we thought, here's the citizens, you know, we can make a difference. We believe in democracy. If we try hard enough, we can make such a small change to make our neighborhoods a little bit cleaner. And in the end, uh, I think it was August of 2014, with just a few months to go until the November election, the Boston Globe did a poll and said we had 62% of the vote was in favor of our bill. Then came $8 million of misleading attack ads, so misleading that the Boston Globe did a story on how misleading they were. And in the end, the $8 million of the misleading ads turned the 6-2 around and made it 2-6. We only got 26% of the vote again. And that's when I saw how impactful money in politics can be. And so I got involved in this because I thought, well, if we can't, you know, be effective as citizens. And in fact, the leader of our group, Lee Kettleson, who used to run Clean Water Action in Boston, she uh, she retired after 25 years, but she said during her career, in the early days, she could get stuff done. But towards the end of it, she she just couldn't get any, any bills passed. And she realized it was because of money politics. So she decided to get involved in this particular issue. And because of her experience as an organizer, she has you know, pretty much take in charge. We don't, none of us get paid. We're all volunteers. Um, we have a budget of less than $5,000 a year. That's mostly to pay for our database that we use. If you don't mind signing up to stay in touch, that would be great. We'll put you on our list. We don't send out a lot of emails. We might send out, I don't know, one a month or so. You're not gonna get bombarded by signing that thing. So if you're interested in keeping in the loop, and from time to time, we'll send out a blast and say, now would be a good time to call your representative in your state center because the bill's going to come for a vote in a couple of weeks and they need to hear from you. So let, let, that's the kind of way that we try to engage people who don't have a lot of time on their hands for volunteering. Of course, if you're willing to volunteer, there's lots of work to do, but um, even at that basic level, it can be very meaningful and helpful. Yes? You know, just a, just a comment just to pick up on this lady's uh, question relative to Big Bang for your buck. Uh, you know, as I was talking over there, a lot that coming out now, uh, the discourse relative to this inquiry. Yeah. And I've been learning a lot because they really do deep dives into the weeds. And, and it seems to me that one of the things you would want to do one of the biggest bang for your buck is to promote unity. Yeah. And to try to listen to and, and, and try to engage uh, the, other, the other viewpoint, to, to listen to that. Because right now, even all of this, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm a staunch liberal Democrat, but it, it, yeah, all of my, we, my wife had a lot of friends in Arizona, and I, I went to school down there, and, and, and basically when I got off at Sky Harbor, I put duct tape on my, yeah. all my, none of my, yeah. they're all, they'll still vote for this guy. Yeah. And, and it's extremely difficult. Um, but I think everybody's in their silos. And there's, you know, Bill Moyer said one of the biggest things the other day, he said the threat of democracy is that shaking great lies yeah. and you know you, you were talking about climate change and, and the republicans have started a long time ago that you know this is not caused by man this has happened before that's all true they don't finish the statement never in this time scale but those people they just they watch that station they feed off that sound bite they don't do their own due diligence they don't read they don't talk to others and that's my question to you it's not uh, sort of pre I don't know the answer to that. I don't know how you promote unity and 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 uh, uh, enable others to communicate with one another for for the very good. I I really don't see it any other way. It's it, it's if anything, it's getting worse. I, I mean, I just before I showed up here, they're they're doing a very good job. The other side of this impeachment, yeah. no one's pre suggesting they're going to win out. But they're doing a very good job. And I know you've heard too, absent Fox, Nixon would not have been impeached. And 
you know, this isn't just sound, this is real, yeah. and it's effective. And so how do you mitigate that, the falseness of a lot of these narratives? And your point that you mentioned earlier about, um, well, there's a reflection now that you know, Mr. Kyle and others, they know full well that they no longer represent their constituency, and they sleep just fine. Right, and, and, and to hear that, this is from a GOP strategist in Iowa who was talking to Democrats about this in MSNBC, and it's absolutely jaw dropping when you hear this power and money to retain that, right? Absent the sole purpose that you're there, but they seem to be powerless to make this kind of change. Well, I, I want to respond to that. You know, the, you're talking about the division in America and the, the misinformation that flies all over the place. Two things one is, I think we need to beef up our educational system and uh, broaden the availability or accessibility of higher education. And part of the problem we now have is student debt that makes it very difficult for a lot of people to go to college. But you know, beyond the fact that uh, a lot of people aren't educated enough to think critically, um, one of the other aspects of life in America today is this deep division between the left and the right. Um, and I really believe that if we could get some, if we could manage to amend the Constitution to get money out of politics, and mind you, polls show that people on both sides of the divide, this is probably the one big issue where we can find common ground. And if we could find common ground to amend the Constitution to get our democracy back and get the money out of the way so that we can Talk to each other. Well, you know, to your point last night, Bill yeah, uh, Blasio was on uh, CNN, and they asked him about his failed campaign. And he said, you know, people listening to me are not going to believe, but from traveling around the country, all states, he finds that we have more in common and more concerns that are common, yeah. blown out of proportion by the media to, yeah. the, to the opposite. I think a lot of the, the divide we should be looking is a divide between the wealthy, the haves, and the have-nots, and not the divide between the red and the blue. I think some of that is artificial. Uh, they say that about Rwanda, with the Tutsis and the Hutus. You know, that was kind of an artificial uh, dichotomy that was created by the British, I think, in some point. And, and what wound up happening was a bloodbath. But I really think that you know money talks, and we are a very money-oriented culture. And I think we're addicted to money, frankly. And I think we lose sight of what's important. It's kind of like that song, you know, real people have part. And we just, you know, we're so focused on our portfolios and our income and how nice our house is, what kind of car we drive. We lose sight of things like love and, um, you know, uh, friendship and things like that that really matter. Um, and it becomes a rather hollow existence, I think. So I'm hoping that if we can get the money out of the way, at least politically, but maybe our discourse will become more civil, we can relate to other people better, and we can talk about the issues in, in the context of what's good for the country. We want to get our, certainly our political leaders, and hopefully citizens too, asking that question, what's good for the country? Not what's good for the Democrats, not what's good for the Republicans, what is good for the country? And if we ask that question, we won't always agree on the answer, but at least we'll know that the other party we're talking to is asking themselves the same question, and we can we can talk about the reasons why your point of view might be better than mine, and the reasons why my point of view might be better than yours. And maybe we go home not having agreed with each other, or agreeing to disagree, but at least having heard the reasons. And then it becomes a question of whose facts are true, and then you can do the research and find out. You know, but at least the money won't be. Um, spreading all these flies around. So, uh, uh, yes. If I could just speak out, this is a personal experience thing, and I do really enjoy coming to these gatherings and these events because I always learn something, and I always feel there's a piece in there for me to become a better person. But I'm a retired nurse, and the Massachusetts Nurses Association have taught me everything I know about politics, and they're still teaching me. And as a retired nurse, I'm staying very involved. 
But as you know, last election, we suffered a crushing defeat on the ballot question. And that question was for ratios and all kinds of safety. It was mainly safety. It wasn't because nurses wanted more money. It's they want safety in their jobs. You know, they're being assaulted and all of this. So what I would like to say is that the Mass Hospital Association, and if anyone here knows anybody, I'm sorry, but I have to get it off my chest in this group where democracy is important. They spent over $30 million to defeat us. And if they put one foot forward to negotiate with us or to do anything, no. They're going about their business like they did before. So they've lost their civility. Well, thank you for bringing up that point. I, again, it gets back to the money. Um, it gets back to the hospitals not wanting to increase their payrolls by adding more nurses. Uh, I would point out that, that my understanding is right that that effort to get um, manageable nurse to patient ratios started way long before the ballot question. 20 years. 20 years, and they tried and tried and tried to get the legislature to take action. And I would remind people that the bottom bill expansion also, we spent at least 10 years trying to get the, we file a bill and try to get them to vote on it. They would not vote on it because it was controversial. Well, so, I think, uh, Paul, I think that the, the way our state government is structured too, with so much power concentrated in the yeah, speakership. Yeah, part of it, yeah. That, Wields more power than the governor does. Certainly does. Yeah. yeah. And you know, what do you know where where he stands on this uh, resolution? He is not. I don't know where Governor Baker is on this issue, and it doesn't. No, I'm talking about the speaker. Oh, the speaker. <laughs> That's a key question because he's holding all the cards, like you said. I don't know. We've been trying to build our strategy is to get a large number of state representatives and senators to co-sponsor the bill, so that when we go to the speaker, we can say, "Look, you know, half or two thirds of the members that actually co-sponsored our bill, and probably some of the others who didn't co-sponsor would vote for it. So, would you please bring it to a vote?" We did that with the bottom. And I don't think it's gonna. I, I'm, I'm very, you know, saying what, this is where the Citizens Commission. I've been to six of their meetings so far and testified each one. And I put this uh, link I gave you. That has all the information. I put that out there for the commission. That's why the name of it, the Citizens Commission. It's for so them. What are, they, what are they doing? They're meeting. They're going to prepare. They're, they are obligated to produce a report by the end of the season, just a few weeks away. So they're, in fact, next Saturday, they're having a four hour meeting in Jamaica Plain to. You know, go over the, the, they've assigned various chapters to various committee members. I'm going to pull it all together and try to, you know, go over each chapter and decide, you know, what they agree to, and then they'll have a draft and whatever. So, um, they're, are, they're, are you on the commission? No, I have lied. There's something like 167 people applied to be on the commission with 15 wow. members. Lawrence Lessig, who is a renowned constitutional scholar, Harvard Law professor, applied to be on the commission and was not appointed. Mm -hmm. Not kidding. So, and some of, at least one of the commissioners has already dropped out and another one hasn't been to any of the meetings. So it's kind of discouraging given the, you know, the, the amount of talent that made themselves available. But it, it, it is what it is. It's, it's, I don't know, you know, what can I say? What, there were three appointed by the governor, three by the speaker, three by the Senate president, three by the attorney general, three by the secretary of state. So, Somehow in that mishmash, we wound up with what we wound up with. One person is on there is Jeff Clements, who wrote the book, Corporations Are Not People. And uh, he's a pretty smart guy. He's been at this for a long time. He's been at this for a I'm not sure if he is on everything, but that's OK. I mean, you know, um, we'll see what happens. But if the commission recommends an amendment of teeth, uh, as opposed to some of the amendment proposals, the most popular and then the proposal, the one that has the most co sponsors in Congress is what I call toothless. It only allows Congress to pass campaign finance reforms and allows the Supreme Court to uh, 
not give constitutional rights to corporations. It doesn't require either one of them to do anything. Business as usual would be quite compatible with an amendment like that. And I don't see any point in amending the Constitution like that. But that's the one that has, and the funny thing about that, I mean, Congress isn't going to bite the hand that beats them. They see the writing on the wall that there's a lot of popular support for an amendment. They don't want to be seen as anti-democratic. So what they do is propose a toothless amendment that they can safely pass and say, see, I'm for democracy. And yeah, OK, it did, it did legalize campaign finance before, but it doesn't require it. And so are you really going to get it? If you, I think Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand. And we will get what we demand and nothing more. So if you start out with a demand for nothing, you're going to get nothing. If you can't count on it, to suddenly jump up and get religion and pass binding campaign finance reform just because we allow them to do so, just because we remove the Supreme Court. Basically, the Supreme Court said we can't do that. We can pass an amendment and say, oh, yeah, we can. Will, will Congress actually do that? Will they bite the hand that feeds them? Will they rock the boat? The system's working for them. They got elected into the current system. A big money system. And they spend half their time raising money. And I don't think they like it very much, but they do it and they're successful at it, and they're not likely to change unless we make them. That's why we need a binding amendment like HJR 48, which is called the Legal People Amendment, as opposed to the Democracy for All Amendment, which is the Jesus. I call it the Democracy for Donors Amendment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a tough fight. There's a lot of, a lot of obstacles. It is our democracy. And it's worth, you know, the, 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 the colonists thought highly enough of democracy that they risked their lives, they left their farms, and they went off and fought against the Red Coats, uh, and they won because they were determined and because it was worth it. And I think we disrespect their sacrifice if we don't, you know, if we're not prepared to fight for democracy. Too. So. I think that's a good place to wrap this up. <laughs>